Apple juice. Far too sweet. I apologize for the lack of an upholstered armchair or a giant bookshelf behind me, but I hope you'll indulge me nevertheless. Would you like to have a vigorous, metaphysical debate about the nature of musical aesthetic? It sounds like a lot of fun, but it kind of misses the point. I want to be very clear about my intentions in this video. I am not trying to provide some knockdown universal rebuttal to the concept of an objective standard and whether it can exist or not. What is that objective standard? What is aesthetic? What does it mean for that to be objective? I don't know. Defining the parameters of that discussion seems like a fool's errand to me. So I'm not going to do that. What I want to do is provide the tools so that you can understand art, and particularly music, without needing an objective standard in your model of the world. Now there is a pretty simple, short version of this that we often avoid for a few reasons, some of which are benign, others not. But first, I can't deny that sometimes it just seems obvious. You know, we might say, yes, my taste in art and music is subjective, but it actually feels like it's not, that it's actually objective. And part of it is that when things come to us through the senses, it comes so quickly that we do not feel the operation of the mind being involved. So when the piece of food hits my mouth and I think that it has too much salt, I don't have access to any brain processes that are influencing that judgment. It's just, yeah, that's too salty. And it's mm -hmm. an immediate feeling. And because it is so immediate, it's hard to imagine that it could have been biased by anything. Then there are some fears that we might have that maybe motivate us to think that art is objective. For one, can artists improve? I mean, if art isn't objective, then how are you supposed to say, ah, you know what, what if you tried this? That might work a little better. That statement doesn't seem to work. What are artists supposed to be learning if there isn't a standard? A fair concern to have. We might also be worried that if art is all subjective, then there are no interesting or meaningful discussions to be had. What are we supposed to be talking about? It seems like it all dissolves into subjectivity soup. Another fair concern. We might also fear that if somebody feels very differently from us, if they hate the things that we love, and we feel antagonized by that, we can't defend ourselves? We can't tell them they're wrong? Like, if you hate my favorite song, I won't be able to tell you you're wrong. But it seems like I can't do that if art is subjective. And at our worst, we might use objectivity to justify hatred of our own. This video is basically that one meme from a few years ago. Remember this one? Good times. Because while it might not make sense to talk about some objective, intrinsic quality of art, there are factual answers to questions about experience and value once you take into account the consumer and the context. The content of art is a very important factor in its value. It's just not the only factor. And that's it. That's the simple answer. Let's imagine a song that we know somehow is objectively really good, but no one likes it. Well, we wouldn't care about that objective standard then. Now you might say, okay, but if the objective standard was legit, then we would like it because it would be good and we like good music. But then what's the difference between what we value and this objective standard? Whatever difference arises there, we're going to, of course, side with what we value. So then our values are actually the standard. Ultimately, we don't care about whatever objectively good art is. Another way to think about it is in terms of goals, what our goals are with consuming or creating art. Now, maybe your goal is as simple as you just want to enjoy yourself. You want to have a good time listening to some music. Or maybe you want art that makes you think about the world and your place in it. Or maybe even an objective standard is present in your mind and you wish for the world to conform to that standard. But in any of these cases, there is a fact of the matter as to whether a piece of content will be conducive towards your goals. Now, just because the content isn't the only thing that matters, doesn't mean the value or the content becomes meaningless, right? It's just not the only thing that matters, but it still matters. 
it's kind of like there's still an equation, there's just more variables now. <laughs> but, but if there is an equation, then that seems kind of objective again. Like if there's a fact of the matter about all this, it sounds kind of objective. And honestly, in some formulation, sure. If you think of the context and the consumer as objects, and of course the content is an object, then you can understand this as relationships between objects. And there's a fact of the matter, and sure, that sounds kind of objective. It's just that's not usually what we mean when we talk about objectivity in art. Usually we're talking about the content being the only thing that matters. And that is how I'll use that term for the rest of this video. Now, while we might be able to come up with these answers, and there are right and wrong answers, there is a limit to our precision. We're going to have to use approximations and heuristics and abstractions and statistics to make these answers because the objects in question are so complicated. Context, that is a lot of stuff. The consumer, that's who you are. And of course the content is also probably pretty complicated. But since there is a fact of the matter, let's revisit those fears I mentioned a minute ago. Can artists improve? Yeah. Artists don't want to get better at making intrinsically good art. They want to get better at making art that achieves their goals, that satisfies their desires. There are courses of action that will achieve this and other courses that will not. And there's a fact of the matter. A teacher might be able to help a student find the right courses of action to achieve their goals. No objective standard required. So yeah, artists can totally improve. Can we have meaningful discussions about art? Absolutely. And this is kind of the reason I started making this video in the first place. Because sometimes something would happen where somebody likes a song, I don't, and I ask why. Because that's interesting. You like this thing, I don't, why is that? And sometimes that would come off as, I'm right, you're wrong, defend yourself. And I hate that, I don't want it to come off like that. Because there is a vast world of intrigue in the question of why we have the experiences that we do with art. And there are lots of meaningful and interesting discussions there. Finally, can we tell people they're wrong? They hate the things that we love? Well, if I tell you that I hate your favorite song, that's just a fact about me. I'm just expressing my preference, and I can't really be wrong about that. Now, maybe you could make a moral case that the way I'm expressing myself is problematic. Maybe I'm being mean. And in that case, well, I'm still not metaphysically incorrect about anything. I'm just ethically problematic in my expression. Maybe if I said that your favorite song is objectively bad, well then I'd be wrong. But usually I'm just going to be expressing my preference, and I can't be wrong about that. The catch is that I might express it idiomatically. I might say, your favorite song is bad, when all I mean is that I don't like your favorite song. So that brings up a good question. What do we mean when we talk about art being good or bad. Sometimes it is that simple. Say a song is good, that just means you like the song. It's bad, you just don't like it. Sometimes we might also be referring to popularity. Saying a song is good means it's popular. Or, or maybe it's a prediction, like this song is good, as in you will like this song. And maybe you are one person, or maybe you are many people. It's like a combination of prediction of popularity. And then there's often an implied cultural context. Like if somebody at a jazz festival was talking about what makes a good drum groove. Sure, it like sounds like objective language, but of course they're talking about that in the context of jazz. They aren't saying these statements with the intention to apply that to all drummers in every style around the world. Right? So in this way, we can think of a lot of these statements as being truncated, where it's not that the song is good, period, but the song is good at doing something in some context. There's an at and there's an in that we truncate, but we usually don't actually say that out loud because it's just implied. So if I said something like, the drum grooves of Nate Smith are some of the best out there. I mean, that makes sense but it's truncated, and the unabridged version would be something like, the drum grooves of Nate Smith are some of the best out there at creating a great listening experience for people who are fans of jazz and funk. 
So there's a cultural context, a genre context, and the drum grooves are good at something. Makes enough sense. But sometimes we like to really emphasize the objectivity in our language for the sake of humor. So I might say something like, Sir Duke by Stevie Wonder is objectively the greatest, best song of all time, and it will allow you to ascend to a higher plane of existence where you will bathe in omniscience. And obviously that is insincere, but is it hyperbole or sarcasm? because which one of those it is will completely change the meaning of what I just said. Whenever we speak insincerely, when we make jokes, there is a meaning that gets conveyed, but the meaning that gets conveyed is dependent upon the audience of the joke understanding the way in which the joke was insincere. So in this case, if that was hyperbole, that means I really actually do like Sir Duke. But if that was sarcasm, that probably means I really hate Sir Duke. Now, in my case, it was hyperbole, but that's something to keep in mind. Or not, but if you don't, then don't be surprised when people don't get what you mean. But sometimes it's really more than that, right? Like, sometimes it's not just a truncation of an at and an in. Sometimes it really feels like we're talking about something more. Like, what about when you say, that song was really good, just not my jam. Like, I didn't personally like it, but I realize it's a really good song. Or sometimes I'll say that about videos, like that was a really well-produced, well-shot video. It's just not for me. Maybe we're just talking about ourselves being weird relative to everyone else, but usually that's not it either. It really seems like we're pointing to something objective, some intrinsic quality of the art. And we almost are. But to solve this one, we're gonna need some cannons. In 1880, Peter Tchaikovsky, the great Russian composer, made a piece called 1812 Overture. Actually, the year 1812, Solemn Overture, actually the title was in Russian. But anyway, it has cannon fire in it. <laughs> and there are a lot of memes about this that you may have seen. Now those cannons are not the kind of cannon that I'm talking about, of course, but they do actually have a really interesting place in the kind of cannon that I am talking about, which is roughly a set of norms or principles or general practices within a field. And that field could be art, but it also could be law or science or math or something else. And canon is great because it tells you about how things are done, what's expected, and most importantly, what has worked for other people in the past that you might be able to use. Now, it might seem like Tchaikovsky really broke the canon of orchestral instrumentation with his artillery, but actually Beethoven beat him by nearly 70 years, putting gunfire into a piece all the way back in 1813. But guns are still not canonical instruments of the orchestra. But you know what else wasn't always a canonical instrument of the orchestra? Symbols. You know, the big metal round things with a hole in the middle. Symbols were not always a canonical instrument of the orchestra. Back in the days of Mozart and Haydn, they were more like sound effects, more like what cannon fire was for Tchaikovsky than what symbols are for the modern orchestra. But of course today, symbols are canonical instruments of the orchestra. And that's how canon works. Canon evolves. People try stuff, and if it works, if they like the result, if people in general like the result, it might get adopted into the canon. In addition to canon that tells you how things are used, like which instruments go in the symphony or what chord progressions are used in jazz, that kind of thing, there's also an underlying canon that tells you what things exist in the first place. And those two canons together are often called with a special name. When you learn music theory, you usually start by learning what things exist, right? You learn, oh, there's harmony and melody and rhythm, there are keys and meters and chords and claves, and then once you have a bit of a vocabulary, you learn about how those things are used in different styles of music. You learn that 2-5-1 chord progressions are important in jazz, or that the 3-2 clave is central to Afro-Cuban music, etc. Now, of course, how things are used is culturally dependent. That's basically how we define different styles of music, what things are used in what ways. But what things exist in the first place, that might seem kind of objective. Hmm. Well, first, let's consider the jord. Now, if you're already familiar with the idea of a jord, that's a bit weird because I came up with them for this video. Thanks for rewatching, I guess. But it goes like this. 
brace yourself. A jord is a sequence of notes such that if you take the scale degrees of each note and concatenate them as digits of a base 10 number, then take the SHA-256 hash of that number with the minimum number of bytes encoding that number that you can have, then you take the hash and encode that in base 64, the last character of the base 64 string will be a J, uppercase or lowercase. And that's a JORD. Link in the description to some Python code. Okay, so whether or not you understood any of that, I think the initial reaction to the idea of a JORD is probably something like, what the f that is some made up bull****. And fair enough, it is made up. But you know what else is made up? Chords time signatures, claves, every music theory concept is made up. The ones that we think of as real are just the ones that are useful. We did not get handed down a tablet from on high that said chords are inherently real things that are fundamentally distinct and singular in the universe. No, I mean chords are just an abstraction of notes. We could actually convey all the same information that we do with chords by talking about the specific patterns of notes that we mean by chords, that would just be really inefficient. Chords are a very useful abstraction on notes for the sake of communication. Jords exist, kind of. I mean, I showed you a few examples a moment ago. They're not some impossible construct. In fact, there's one jord in particular that I think many of you have seen many times. <laughs> I know I have. But the reason why it doesn't quite sit right the reason why we're hesitant to call jords a real thing is just because jords are not helpful in understanding music. They're actually purposefully unhelpful with the use of cryptography. But chords, chords are helpful in some contexts. For instance, you might have a jazz bass solo. Let's say you have some drums and a bass playing a jazz tune and the bass is playing monophonically. So there are no chords actually playing it's all monophonic, there's no polyphony. But the bassist is probably playing the changes. That is, what they play is informed by the underlying chord progression of that tune, which means understanding the concept of a chord is crucial to understanding the music being played, even though there aren't actually any chords being played. On the other hand, you could have something like a round, let's say, of Row 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 Your Boat, a three-part round of Row Row Your Boat, and look at that, there's polyphony, there are chords. But if we try to analyze this in terms of the chords that are being played, that doesn't help us understand what's going on at all or communicate about it. If I wanna communicate this piece, I'm not gonna tell you what the chords are. I'm gonna tell you that it's row, row, row your boat in a three-part round. Time signatures are an even stronger example of this, I think, because in Western music, we really take time signatures for granted. Time signatures are baked into our very notation system in a way that even chords are not. And it can feel like time signatures are basically universal, that if you have rhythm, you have a time signature. But that's not the case. In North Indian classical music, for instance, Hindustani music, they don't have time signatures, they have tal. If you interpreted a Hindustani piece of music, if you analyzed it using time signatures, you would get, at best, an incomplete picture. You need to use Hindustani theory to understand Hindustani music. So just as symbols role in the symphony is subject to canon and culture, so too are the very structures that are the building blocks of music theory. They are also part of a canon. They are also subject to culture. When you recognize a face, like my face for instance, there's a very slim chance that you're explicitly aware of all the facets of my face that let you know that it's my face, yet we are, most of us, still pretty good at facial recognition. And a similar thing happens with canon. As you are exposed to an art form, you become implicitly aware of the canons of that art form. You pick up on things, on patterns and techniques that tend to be present in preferable art. And you probably don't have names for these things. That would come with theory. But when you recognize a big difference between the canonical quality and your own personal experience of a piece of art, that is when we get these statements like, that's a really good song, it's just not for me. And why is that difference there? Well, there's all sorts of reasons. The simplest one is probably just a negative event from your life that is associated with this song. 
And this is one where you can probably consciously parse it out, right? You're probably explicitly aware that, okay, if this event wasn't associated with it, then I probably would like this song actually, you can probably tell. But it could also be more subtle than that. Maybe the piece of art just doesn't take any risks because there is this kind of meta canon, if you will, that we should be breaking existing canons. We should be trying new stuff. And so you could have a piece of art that's, you know, really solid. It employs lots of techniques that have legacies of being conducive towards preferable art. But it doesn't try anything new. And, and if that's all it did, then uh, maybe you don't like that. Or maybe it's just a perfect storm, and for some array of nebulous reasons, it doesn't work for you in particular, where it works for everyone else. Or maybe it doesn't work for anyone, and, and that particular song is just cursed with some complex system. You know, whatever, case by case basis, right? This can also go the other way, of course, where you say, like, that is a bad song, but I actually still really enjoy it. And that could have a similarly simple thing where it's just a positive event associated with that song from your life. Or it could be something like nostalgia. Like maybe it's a song that's, you know, from your childhood, so you hear it and you feel all warm and fuzzy inside, but you, you recognize that maybe if you had listened to it first as an adult, maybe you wouldn't have liked it so much. Although the music that we listen to as children has a really big impact on our preferences as adults. We've talked a lot about how canons arise from preferences, that preferences influence canon, but actually it goes the other way as well, right? Like if you think of, if you have two people who grow up in vastly different musical cultures, and then you show them the same piece of music, they're going to have vastly different emotional interpretations of that same piece of music. There's a cool article about this that I'll link in the description, but you know, maybe it's a trivial point. What it tells us though is that canon and preferences actually co-evolve. Kind of cool. But that is what's going on with these statements that seem so clearly to indicate an objective standard. But nope, it's about canon, which arises from a history of people's values and preferences, and honestly seems a lot more meaningful than an objective standard ever could be. Now, if you can remember back to about eight minutes ago, we were talking about Beethoven and Tchaikovsky, and they both really did not like their pieces with gunfire. Beethoven in particular had some colorful words to say about his piece with gunfire. And I think that's kind of fitting, right? It's like they tried gunfire in symphonies and it didn't work. It didn't make it into the canon. They didn't like it. But there are other musical traditions where gunfire kind of has made it into the canon, like hip hop. There's a track called Paper Planes by M.I.A. And uh, it's made something of a resurgence recently, I think. Maybe that's just my personal bias, but I think it's made something of a resurgence. It's from the early 2000s. And in the chorus, there are four gunshots followed by the sound of a cash register. And all five of those sounds are the same volume, which is ridiculous if you think about it, right? Guns are so, so, so much louder than cash registers. <laughs> but that works because for hip hop, Amplification has always been an option. Hip-hop is a much younger musical tradition than classical European music, and amplification has always been part of the technological options. And so that didn't get incorporated in classical music. It's not that classical music was just too sophisticated. Oh, we would never meddle with the sounds of warfare in our music. We will stick strictly to metaphor. No, they tried. <laughs> they literally tried to have gunfire in the music. It just didn't work. But hip-hop succeeded where classical music failed because of the difference in technology. Andrew Huang has a fantastic video about amplification in particular and how that has affected music drastically. But more broadly, we often like to think about the historical and cultural reasons for why music is the way that it is, why different traditions have evolved the canons that they have evolved. But technology is a really big and important factor there. And speaking of technology... Tech reviewers give you some information so that you can better determine whether a given product is going to be worth your money or not. And they might also provide some entertainment. I watch MKBHD videos all the time, not because I'm ever going to buy any of the products, but because I just really like those robot arm shots that he puts at the beginning of product reviews. It's all about the robot arm shots, really. But as opposed to the tech world, the music and the art world are in a bit of a conundrum, if this is all subjective, right? I mean, what is the role of an expert or a critic in this world of subjectivity? Because there is this idea that 
experts come to know what good art is as they become a master of their craft. And that kind of falls apart, right? Well, I do think that experts have something to bring to the table, which is that an expert might be able to articulate why a piece of art did what it did. They might be able to explain why it invoked the experiences it did. It's not that an expert's experience of the art is more true or more meaningful than other people's experience, but they might be able to explain why it happened the way it did. For instance, you might be making a chord progression and you want to make it sound jazzy, and you figured out that seventh chords sound jazzy, but you haven't learned about two five ones yet. So then the expert comes in and they say, hey, you know what, if you added some two five ones, it would sound even jazzier. It's not that the expert came in and determined that your progression didn't sound sufficiently jazzy. They just explained why it didn't sound sufficiently jazzy and provided a way to improve. Okay, but then what about critics? Because isn't the whole point of a critic to say whether something was good? Like a reviewer specifically, isn't their whole role to say whether something was good? Maybe. I mean, sometimes reviewers actually have a very similar function. They have the same predictive power as tech reviewers. A spoiler-free movie review does exactly the same thing, right? It gives you some information so that you can better determine whether a given ticket is going to be worth your money and time. But then there's spoiler-full reviews and there's music reviews, articles written about songs that you've already listened to. What is the purpose there? Well, it's going to be insight in some way or another. I mean, there's also entertainment. I watch Fantano sometimes, mostly for the comedy. But when I'm watching The Needle Drop, an album review, or when I'm reading an article about a song, what I'm looking for is insight, and that can come in a number of ways. Maybe there's some experience that I had but I wasn't able to put into words, but this critic articulated it beautifully, and that's really cool. Or maybe it's an explanation about why the art did what it did, kind of like I was talking about with experts. A reviewer might say, for instance, that, you know, I really liked the lush guitar tones and the clear cutting vocals and how they meshed in the mix. And I might read that and think, you know what? I really like that song and that's totally why. I like clear cutting vocals and lush guitar tones mixed together. I just learned something about myself. That's pretty cool. Now it's important there that lush and clear cutting were the terms used instead of just saying good guitars, good vocals, good mix because that wouldn't provide much information. Being specific, I think, is pretty important. And it's tempting to think that specificity can get you objectivity, that maybe if you just simply dryly and specifically describe the contents of the art without ever talking about whether you like it or not, that you can be objective. But that doesn't quite work, because simply by choosing what to talk about and therefore what to omit, you are making a subjective value judgment. So specificity is great, but it doesn't get you to objectivity. When people do argue that art is objective, they usually do so with something that I'll call the rubric argument. The rubric argument basically goes like, look, here I have a list of attributes and they are objectively measurable and you can use them to judge a piece of art and no personal bias is necessary. So here's the attributes, apply them, judge the art, it's objective, it only concerns the content of the art, not your personal bias. Great. Objective. Can music be evaluated objectively? I think so. Yeah, I, th I do. I think so based on three very simple criteria found here in my magical orange notebook. And they are talent, complexity, and ambition. There are several objective merits you can point to such as character progression through action, choreography, direction, and more. These objective references can be used to make a conclusion on the film's overall quality. And you know what? Rubrics are actually quite useful. If you're in a teaching position, say, you might want to be fairly consistent and fair, and you might want to remove some of your personal bias, and actually rubrics are helpful for that. But they don't get you to objectivity. Let's imagine a simple rubric, a very simple rubric, that has only one item, length. That's all that matters. The longer a song is, the better it is. So which of two songs is better, which is longer? Same thing, easy, objective, right? Now, obviously, this is absurd. <laughs> that's not how we value music, but that's just it. It's not how we value music. It's a value judgment when you put stuff on the rubric. What items go on, what items don't make it, that's a value judgment that you have to make. And how is that informed? 
through your personal and cultural biases, not looking so objective anymore. Now, you might say, look, all right, fine. The rubric itself is constructed in a somewhat subjective way, so we don't get objectivity from the rubric argument, fine, but at least the application of the rubric can be objective, right? I mean, we can at least, you know, we say like, okay, well, we have this rubric and it's kind of absurdly constructed, but we can apply it consistently. Length, that's simple and objective, right? Right? Well, a lot of music is not defined by a recording, but by a composition. A lot of music, maybe most music, is not primarily defined by a recording. And when you get to compositions rather than recordings, the length is a bit fuzzy. I mean, if you take a jazz standard, I mean, jazz standards might be played for you know, two minutes, or it might be a 20 minute rendition. I mean, there's a huge range there. A lot of other pieces are, are more well-defined, like if you have some classical pieces, like, okay, like, obviously, Ode to Joy is shorter than Scheherazade, but it's fuzzy at best and completely ambiguous at worst in the case of jazz standards. So maybe this doesn't work if it's not recorded music. But fine, okay, at least we can say for recorded music... The length is clearly objective, right? There's clearly an objective length. It's just the length of the audio file. That's it, right? But what about those few seconds of silence at the end of tracks that artists often add? Do you count those? This might seem really minute, but, but if you count those, how much silence do you allow? Like three seconds of silence at the end, fine. I mean, that, that seems pretty, pretty fine. But like, what if it's 10 seconds? What if it's 30? What if I make a three minute track but then I say, you know what, I want this to be longer so that it's better, because this is how we define objective quality in art. <laughs> so I add 10 minutes of silence onto it. And now it's a 13-minute track, and it's really great. I mean, obviously that's absurd, right? But where do you draw the line? That would have to be a value judgment. Okay, so, so maybe we don't, we don't count silence. So it's just the first sound to the last sound, okay? But then I say, you know what, actually, it's not 10 minutes of silence anymore. It's actually just 10 minutes of a sine wave that's really, really quiet. So it basically sounds like silence, but it's not quite technically silent. And so you say, okay, well, well obviously that still kind of counts as silence, though. I mean, it basically is the same thing. So now you have to draw a threshold for what counts as silence. Oh, you have to draw a threshold in this case as well. So whether or not you choose to count the silence, which is itself a value judgment, you then will have to make another value judgment as to the threshold of either what counts as silence or how much silence to allow. So even the length of a recorded piece of music is not objective. And this is for something as simple as length. And look what we had to do to make it really objective. Right, we could put our foot down here and just say, look, it's just the length of the audio file, that's it. It's for recorded music only, okay, this rubric only applies to recorded music. And it's just the length of the audio file in seconds, that's it. And finally, we've gotten something that I, I think is objective, but it's also entirely meaningless. There might have been some semblance of meaning before, because maybe you say, okay, more music is better, so a longer song is better right? But now a, a bunch of silence counts. Just a bunch of silence that counts. And so now we've lost all meaning. And this is what happens when you try to make the items on your rubric more objective. They also become less meaningful. And if this is what we had to do to something as simple and seemingly objective as length, imagine what we'd have to do with something that people actually put on these rubrics like complexity. Complexity is an interesting one to me because a lot of us have pretty strong intuitions about the relative complexities of different styles of music, but then a lot of our intuitions contradict one another. So it is subjective, although one place where there maybe isn't as much contradiction, in our society at least, is the refrain that pop music is not complex, right? Now, I think a lot of viewers of this channel are already on board with the idea that pop music's complexity comes from the songwriting and the production, not the harmony. 
but there is a strong legacy of European classical music theory in our society that biases us towards saying that harmonic complexity is the most important kind of complexity. And Adam Neely basically has a whole video about this if you want more. But that results in us saying that, hey, this thing isn't harmonically complex, it must not be complex at all. Now this is of course the Ed Sheeran, Taylor Swift, Maroon 5 kind of pop music, not hip hop. Although speaking of hip hop, one of my favorite examples of complexity is rapping and scatting and their relationship with traditional vanilla singing, where you have an explicit melody and you have words that are in sentences roughly, that kind of thing, right? So rapping and scatting have a kind of mirrored relationship. It goes like this. Scatting sacrifices verbal complexity for the sake of melodic complexity. Not all verbal complexity, but some. And rapping does it the other way around. Rapping sacrifices some, but not all, melodic complexity to go deeper in verbal complexity with wordplay and rhyme schemes and the semantic content. So, there isn't really a meaningful quantitative difference between the complexity levels of these three vocal techniques, but qualitatively we can talk about how their complexities differ, and that's super interesting, right? Now to be clear, rapping does have melody, it does have melodic complexity, there is pitch contour and that pitch contour is meaningful, and similarly, scatting has grammar in a sense. There is still meaning to the syllables that you use and the order that you put them in. But those complexities are lessened so that other complexities can be deepened. Now if you're not familiar with scatting and rapping, you might just perceive scatting as a lesser form and rapping as a lesser form of vocal technique, where it's just like uh, it's singing with gibberish and it's speaking in a rhythm. But that's because of ignorance. There is actually more complexity there that you're just not aware of. Now, it is impossible to be familiar with all styles of music, of course. But what you can do is be aware that if you intuit that some style of music is lesser, that it's less complex, and you're not familiar with it, it's probably just ignorance. There is probably complexity there that you just aren't aware of. So, great. Rubrics don't get us to objectivity, uh, but they are useful. We can have meaningful discussions about art. Artists can improve at doing what they actually want to do. Okay, so why does any of this matter? Beyond the philosophical intrigue, why should we care about whether art is subjective? If you internally construct your own rubric, so to speak, and then you judge art from outside of your own culture with that rubric, you'll find that that other art is objectively inferior to the art from your culture. Funny how that works. You might be able to avoid some personal bias with rubrics, but you're never going to be able to escape cultural bias. If you really do want to get rid of all cultural bias with a rubric, you basically have two options. Either you could have a vapid, meaningless rubric because you've taken out anything pertaining to people's experiences, or you could have a rubric that takes into account all culture, which would work. Small problem is that it's impossible. So neither of these actually happens. Instead, you end up with some amount of personal bias and a whole lot of cultural bias. Bigotry and objectivity tend to go together. That doesn't mean you're necessarily a bigot if you have the objective view or the other way around, but they do help each other out, particularly because people rationalize their beliefs. We don't tend to arrive at our dispositions and emotions and belief as a result of a reasoning process. We use reasoning to rationalize existing beliefs, and we can do that with bigotry and objectivity. Because art is really important to culture and it reflects the emotions and values and intellect of a culture, if you can convince yourself that some other culture's art is objectively inferior, it's a lot easier to justify hatred for that culture. Now this usually doesn't take the form of their points get graded lower on your rubric than yours, because usually your rubric actually collapses into more of a checklist. 
There's an example of this from the Ladies Monthly Museum, which was an English periodical from the 19th century. In their December 1818 issue, they had a segment about American Indian music. As you can imagine, it was incredibly awful and racist. I'm not going to read it here. But one thing they mentioned was the idea that American Indian music lacked any notion of harmony, melody, or variety. Sounds familiar, huh? There are three elements to music. There is harmony, there is, there is melody, and there is rhythm. Okay. And rap only fulfills one of these, the rhythm section. That there's not a lot of melody, and there's not a lot of harmony. And so it's not actually a form of music. Of course, American Indian music and rap both do have melody, for instance. These ideas are usually wrong on many levels. The rubric is wrong in its very conception, but then the actual formulation of the rubric is also wrong, and then the application of the rubric is also done poorly. Because if it wasn't done poorly, it wouldn't work very well to rationalize bigotry. The objective view is in some ways easier. It's not easier to philosophically defend, as I hope I've shown in this video, but day-to-day -day processing things might be easier because you don't have to tackle big, complicated questions about how people experience art. Because, yeah, those are complex matters. Fortunately, we do have things like canon, so that we don't have to calculate the neuroscience every time we want to play a chord. We just know what chords have done what things in the past. But that's the point here. Bigotry is why this is really important. And I think we should dismantle the tools that rationalize hatred. And I hope that, in part, that's what this video has done. Whether or not there is an objective standard for art, we don't actually need it to understand art or to achieve our goals with art. Ultimately, we don't want to listen to objectively good music. We want to listen to music that satisfies our desires. And maybe that's just, I want to feel good. Or maybe you want to think when you listen to something, or maybe you want to feel sad. Whatever it is, there's a way to do it. Answers to questions about experience and reception and the impact of music have deep, complex answers that we probably can't answer precisely. We're going to have to use heuristics and approximations and canon. But there is a fact of the matter, and we can learn how to get those answers right with canon and theory and by building up intuition. If I make a song and I want to know whether people like it, I can't just query the song itself. I also have to know who's listening. Why are they listening? Where are they listening? How? When? Right? And maybe that's something as complicated as a cultural or political context, or something as simple as don't make the 808 too loud because people are listening on phone speakers. <laughs> Whatever it is, there's a real answer. There's ways to do this. And we don't need an objective standard for anything. That was when I was doing the take, the like first, the first shot about Tchaikovsky and Canon and stuff. I literally walked by this guy just now. Nature, bro. <laughs>